Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For the last five weeks, you, the congregation, have given me, your pastor, the challenging task of preaching on a different world religion every week. This may be the last time I ever let you pick a sermon series topic. So I hope you enjoyed it. Let's consider some of what we've learned as we wrap things up. We learned that there are 330 million Hindu gods and goddesses, and yet deities are symbols of Brahman, ultimate reality. Buddhism is the middle way, the way between attachment and detachment. Life for Buddhists is about learning to embrace existence, accept existence, and then let it all go. Judaism was the first monotheistic religion, stressing the observance of the commandments, the study of Torah, and the importance of community and family. Christianity is the most humanized religion, since Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, especially in the midst of suffering. And Islam means submission to Allah. Muslims use the Quran and Muhammad's sayings, the Hadith, to lead holy lives. And this internal spiritual striving is the true meaning of jihad. Hopefully we simply know more about world religions. But one of the most important questions of modernity is how to be authentically religious in your own faith and yet also respect your neighbor's faith or lack of faith. It's important to know what our neighbors actually believe and practice as part of any religious tradition. Though we also need to know commonalities. Marty kindly shared a handout with me from his international law class that highlights teachings all religions use to resolve ethical dilemmas. Muslims teach, no one of you is a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. Christians teach, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jews teach, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Buddhists teach, hurt not others with that which pains yourself. And Hindus teach, do nothing to your neighbor which you would not have him do to you. The similarities are striking, and all people of faith would do well to bear this in mind. So we've learned more about each faith, and we can see commonalities and differences, so now we can move today to how we as Christians should respond to other world religions. I'll outline four responses that I learned when I was in seminary. This is from my systematic theology class, so you know it has to be good. So some of these responses may ring true for you. Others may feel incredibly uncomfortable. But here are our four options. So the first response we could have to relating to our neighbors of other faith traditions is the exclusivist position where we Christians see our religion as true and all other religions as false. This position highlights that we need to share the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ with the hope that this sharing will bring people to God. For exclusivists, certain Christian convictions are not negotiable, like our God-given salvation through the life death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the only path for atonement at one mint with God. Our second response could be the inclusivist position, where Christians see truth and sacred content in other religions, but we believe that Jesus Christ is God's saving love fully revealed. So if we would hold to this position, 
We would believe that only in Christianity can a person find completion and wholeness. There are rays of truth in other religions, but the fullness of truth is the Christian gospel. One way the inclusivist position is explained is that Christianity is the crown of other religions. Our third response could be the pluralist position, where we are open to the fullness of other religions, believing that all religious paths lead to ultimate reality and are true in some sense. When we witness to the good news as Christians, we might say that Jesus is truly the savior of the world, but not the only savior of the world. John Hick is a religion scholar I use throughout this, this series to speak about the shadowy side of each faith, and he's a pluralist. Hick says that we should view the world religions as planets. All are in orbit around the truth, or God. Each faith has its insights into God, but all religions orbit the same thing, just using different languages, symbols, sacred texts, and rituals. The fourth response, this is the last one, we can have as Christians to other world religions is actually still developing. It's the post-liberal position, which urges full descriptions of religions while acknowledging the complexity of our modern world and holding on to one religion, though we value many. The post-liberals argue that the religions of the world are so different, you really can't measure one from the perspective of another. And if you say that all religions are the same, which detractors argue that pluralists do, then you actually aren't being respectful because you're denying each religion's uniqueness. So, as you can see, Christians have varied responses to world religions, exclusivist, inclusivist, pluralist, or post-liberal. So whatever response speaks to you, truthfully, the point is we can't avoid relating to people of other faiths. Brian McLaren, an emergence Christianity scholar, argues for a Christian identity that is both strong and kind, and is noted for his interfaith work with Muslims. Of all the positions outlined, he seems to be hanging out with the post-liberals, and he once related, since 2001, I've been convinced that Christianity um, involves both witness graciously and confidently sharing our unique Christ-centered message, and withness, experiencing solidarity with people of other faiths, worshiping in one another's presence, and working together for the common good. McLaren asks in his latest book, if it's possible to have a Christian faith that combines key elements of conservative New Line Christianity strength, commitment, intensity of meaning, with key elements of liberal old-line Christianity. That's us. Ecumenism, reasonableness, and a peaceable attitude. What he ends up doing is imagining all, this, all these religious figures we just explored in a bar together. <laughs> McLaren writes, so we might expect a chuckle as Muhammad orders a Wahhabi cocktail, a mixed drink of warm milk, sugar, and hot tea, since alcohol is officially forbidden to Muslims and the Wahhabis are known for their strictness on such matters. We might expect a smile as the Buddha makes a sage comment about the mindful breaking of the fifth precept after which he orders a mojito then makes a toast to moderation in all things, including following the fifth precept. And perhaps there would be outright laughter if Moses were to part his margarita, and Jesus were to order water, and then with a wink, turn it into a fine Stellenbosch pinotage. 
McLaren doesn't depict Jesus trying to convert Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad at the bar. Nor does he deny the individuality of each religious figure, as is reflected in their presumed drink orders. In his mind, these religious figures and the religions they represent are able to happily coexist. Interfaith work is becoming increasingly important as our world becomes smaller and our communities more diverse. In just two days, we'll have an interfaith Thanksgiving service here in Lexington. And I invite you to come and experience worship in an interfaith context. What we as clergy do is authentically represent our own faith traditions while being respectful of the faith of others. Worship in interfaith contexts these days often highlights the blessings of diversity. If we all water ourselves down too much, then no one feels good about worshiping together because it just doesn't feel authentic. Naval Chaplain Rabbi Arnold Reznikoff speaks of an interfaith service he once participated in. He said, we didn't attempt to craft a shared prayer, but instead we invited all who were in attendance to offer a prayer for peace based on their specific tradition. And in the midst of incense, Gregorian chanting, and prayers in Latin, in Hebrew, and in Greek, no one felt uncomfortable. Simply hearing prayer for peace from such a plethora of religious traditions. But whenever we worship together, we must also bear in mind the shadowy sides of our respective faiths. As you heard throughout this series, each and every religion has a shadowy side. None of us are perfect or have practiced our faith perfectly throughout our histories. Personally, I admire a story from the rabbinic tradition that tells of two friends. One asks the other, do you love me? Of course, his friend responds. Well, do you know what hurts me? No, what hurts? Well, how can you say you love me if you don't know what hurts me? Relationships have to develop in interfaith work, and we have to see ourselves reflected in one another. We discover not just what unites us and what a blessing religious diversity can be, but what can deeply hurt our friends of other religious traditions. We end up striving to be better with and for each other. In the end, McLaren affirms that God is not a doctrine to be mastered, but a mystery to be mastered by. God is not a doctrine to be mastered, but a mystery to be mastered by. If we bring some humility to interfaith work and relationships with our neighbors of other faiths, if we recognize that there is mystery here that no religion may fully grasp, then perhaps we can all get mastered by the mystery of the divine. Maybe it's possible for our respective faiths to be just one path up the mountain, and no one knows exactly what's going on up there in that holy place, because maybe in that holy place we'll encounter divinity differently, and that's okay. Maybe we are planets orbiting the same God or truth, simply using varied language, symbols, texts, and rituals to connect. Or maybe salvation and at one minute doesn't mean the same thing in every religion, and we're not meant to have the exact same religious ends. And maybe Allah, God, Yahweh, and Brahman, however we conceptualize the divine, is totally cool with that. Maybe our job is to simply and profoundly 
support one another on our respective faith journeys, whatever they may be. We might actually be onto something there. And that, my friends, is interfaith understandings and the end of this sermon series. Getting back into my Christian language, praise God and thank you, Jesus. Amen.